Welcome to our show. Today, I'm bringing on Sensei Richard from Kenzen Karate here in Victoria. He's somebody who I consider uh, a real leader. The way he runs his club, the way he's active in our community, the way I've seen him take leadership roles, especially during COVID, is somebody who I find extremely inspiring. So let's bring him on and see what he can tell us today. Hello, Richard. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to just know a little bit. I know that you um, studied karate in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know just a little bit. You have your own center. It's, it's a great center. And I wanted to know a little bit more about how you got to that point where you decided or what point in your life were you like, I want to do karate. And then at what point did you figure out like, this is my life. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, probably when I was 15 years old, I realized that I really liked being a coach. Um, and I love seeing people make a positive change in their life. So I started running kids classes. And by the time I was helping out with them, and I was never really that good at performing, but I seemed to connect with people on the coaching and teaching side. So at 15, I started helping out. And then suddenly the instructor at a recreation center I was helping um, just had to leave. And I was training in a headquartered uh, dojo downtown and the place where I was helping out with, the instructor left. Next thing you know, I had 40, 50 kids and I was 15, 16 years old. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but they were, we were connecting with each other. And by the time I went to university when I was 18, I had three recreation center uh, programs. And, um, and as I kept uh, you know, having a great time teaching the kids, I kept feeling like I wanted to just be a better um, professional instructor. And I started looking at like a professional tennis coach or professional golf instructor or you know, a scuba diver instructor who really knows what um, their industry, their skills quite deeply and works on it every single day. That's when I decided to go to Japan when I was 21. And I was there on and off for two years, learning quite a bit, seeing, you know, oh, wow, I really need to catch up to where other people were at my age. And I just took off from there. So now I am 48. So it's been a, a long journey. And uh, maybe when I was, how old was I? About 27, I could do it full time. That's when I started doing it as a full time job. Yeah. Um, so there's the coaching side, and then there's your own personal practice with karate because. To be a, yeah, you can be a great coach, but you also wanted, it sounds like you have a very high level and that takes a ton of discipline and a lot of commitment, you know, and I don't think people realize, or maybe people do realize, but it's such a big commitment. And how did you stay on that path where you were like, I want to be a coach, but I really also want to have a great level of karate. Yeah. I mean, it was tough. Um, Cause the hardest, the hardest part was dealing with myself. So in my teens, my twenties, um, I was still figuring out what the whole karate world was and how much I had to work out and, um, and would I work out in the right way, going for the right goals. So uh, eventually I wanted to make the BC team and um, do as well as I could, um, you know, going to nationals, both yeah, for the all style nationals and then for my own style. Um, and then I think it wasn't until I was really in my thirties, I actually figured out how to personally train on a consistent basis. And one thing I found was um, reduce your desire and increase your consistency. So a lot of people want something right now today and when they can't get it, they get depressed. My thing was, okay, let's just do it for five years. Let's pick a goal and go for five years and just be consistent a little bit every day at it. And then knowing not to get upset at myself if I don't work out every day or if I don't eat right that day or yeah, just take that pressure off. And that, the, in the long run, that worked much better. So then last year, I was able to pass a six degree black belt test. And I think you know, I, part of it was luck and timing. I was healthy on the right day and, the, and, and they saw the right part of me. Um, but I think it's that type of approach. So just to be good at anything, 
have a goal, work at it consistently, but don't put any pressure on yourself if you don't achieve it tomorrow. Yeah. That's great advice. And the karate world, it's from like the Eastern philosophies. And as somebody who's had a lot of yoga experience, it also comes from that as well. But it's different because you're not supposed to be focused too much on the physical side, whereas karate you are. But there is, there is a philosophy and I'm wondering how similar it is. Like, can you just tell me, and I'm sure it changes with your sensei and your schools, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, what is the main, the, the common thread as far as a certain philosophy goes when you're studying karate with somebody? What are the things they kind of impart on you? Yeah, the best instructors I've had are very down to earth. So it's common sense it's you know consistency there's no magic um anything that starts to smell like a cult anything that starts to smell like uh, too many layers on you for someone else's reasoning anything that's not scientifically proven all that stuff ha you have to really get rid of that you know um it has to be just about consistency and just common practices and then good ethics you know? Yeah. Um, so there's no, anytime you get into something like mysticism or chi or something, a lot of that, that, that stuff doesn't exist because you can't prove it. But what you can prove is just consistent practice and just getting out there and doing it. So um, that's really been important because uh, even in Japan, the top instructors that I've ever been with, it's just about the grind. Who can do the grind? You know, when you look at someone who takes like, um, um, a, a sh uh, tries to take a, a shortcut, they're doing a shortcut because they don't want to put in the work. And I'm, I'm not perfect at, at all. Like, but I, I am the one thing I'm good at is grind, you know? So, um, and that, I think uh, a lot of young people need to hear that. And even, you know, not young people need to hear that is, you got to do the grind. Absolutely. You know? um, it's yeah. harder these days because people will, and you've noticed, I'm sure, uh, everyone wants everything right away, right? Like the whole instant mm -hmm. gratification. And it's the same with every discipline. If you want to really have good technique and uh, a good foundation, I mean, I see it with piano. I see it with yoga. It's like, I mean, I went to a piano. We have piano concerts twice a year, and there was somebody there. Yeah probably like 22 and he played this amazing Chopin piece and I was like kind of jealous because I was like I've been I've been playing my whole life and I'll probably never get to that level and yep. he'd only been playing with a teacher for a month and I was like oh, wow yeah and I was like at, at the end I had to talk to him and I was like I don't understand <laughs> like I'm in my 40s I've been playing since I was eight like why yep. how and he goes well I just have a really good ear and I practice on YouTube, but I can't read music. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm taking lessons. And yeah. he said, it's so hard for me to actually sit and try to learn how to read and all those things. And I was thinking, okay, okay so he, you know, yeah, he has that, that um, he can play that stuff, but there's the technique and the foundation and the reading and all these vast things that come with the discipline. And he has to start from the beginning, just like anybody else, even if he has mm -hmm. one part, that he might be natural at, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure in karate, you see some students might have certain ability, natural abilities. Maybe they have a, a certain strength or a balance or whatever you see and you're like, wow, they can go far, but they need this, this, this. They're not focused or they're not whatever they, they need. And so you kind of bring in that foundation and make it more of a rounded out, balanced uh, path for them, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think uh, anybody who enjoys the daily workout or sees some benefit or feels that, you I mean, part of it, you know, is the physical side, like getting stronger. Part of it's the mental side. These are puzzles. You know, when you're doing a karate form, a kata, they're old and esoteric and you're like, what does it mean? Like, is it really practical? And it's a lot of it's a puzzle and it's like an obstacle course for your mind and you get better at, figuring out how to do this obstacle course faster and more clean, maybe similar to playing a, a piece in piano, 
because you can see it, you can read it, you can see it, if you know playing it, going through that process. And then the other part I think is just, you know, I think a lot of people, why they stay in something is the social interaction. You know, they'll stay because they're, they're enjoying their time with the instructor and they're enjoying their time with the people that they're, they're friends with. I remember being in um, the National Sport Institute of Canada a long time ago. We did this course, um, it talks about um, uh, athlete development and they had done a study of two groups of swimming athletes from 10 years old to 18, about, about those ages. And they asked them, are you happy? Are you satisfied that you, for your last eight years, your middle school and high school years, that you went to the swimming pool in the morning and you went to the swimming pool after school and you maybe didn't get to go to all the dances and the um, parties and hang out with your friends, go to the mall as much as you saw the other kids do in school. And there's two sort of groups of answers. One side was really upset that their parents had pushed them. Yeah. And they had let their parents push them. And they felt like they had missed their childhood. Mm -hmm. And the other side thought they had the best childhood of all. Yeah. Like they thought, wow, I'm so fit. I've been able to travel. I've been able to do stuff. Now I can go into any sport. So uh, I took away from that is not to judge. You know, if, they're, if someone's enjoying the process, that's their that's where they're at. And if they do it slightly differently, that's good for them. You know, they got off the couch and they got out yeah. there and did it, you know? So in my dojo, I try and create a, a really down to earth, positive atmosphere, you know, and then let people decide for themselves where that journey is going to be. Yeah. And like, so with, because you mentioned earlier, like you, you like the grind, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I've noticed like with my own practice as well, like, did you have a, was there a time I'm sure there was, cause I went through it too, like where you're pushing yourself and you get hurt a lot, you know, and then you're like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then you just kind of learn through that. Like you learn through hurting yourself. Yeah. Like, wow, that was, I was not ready for that. Why did I push myself? Cause sometimes you're like, I just want to see if I can do it, you know? And then, sure. yeah. then you're like, Oh, I have to recover. It's like a long road. Like there's certain things I can't do the way I used to until I get better now or whatever. Um, and like, how do you, how did you find that harmony or balance between pushing yourself in a way where you kind of are suffering and then going to that place where you said earlier, like, I don't feel guilty if I don't do that workout I was hoping to do. I'm just going to mm. enjoy, like, I know that I'm, I'm basically committed. I'm going to have this type of practice where it's pretty much every day and I'm going to, I'm going to get yep. it done. But like, how do you find the pleasure, do you, at what point did you find pleasure in that? Well, number one is you're going to get hurt. So that's just part of it. And I went from in my teens and twenties to not getting depressed, but upset to by the time I got to my thirties, I kind of would, would laugh about it. Like yeah. I'm, I'm a science experiment. Oh, I hurt myself <laughs> again. And as like, one of the other instructors, Pete here, who knows me because he was in Japan when I was there working for me in training, you know, that a lot of times I would take myself to the edge and hurt myself quite often. And um, so you have to be a really attuned to your, your yeah. body. But then when you do get hurt, you just go, you just debrief yourself. All right. So I went too far or I, it just happened and I'm not supposed to be upset about it. I'm supposed to train around it. And then you just, people, I think that's that gratification like you know now I'm, now I'm injured my whole life is over no it's not it's just you're doing sports you could be on the couch get really fat have a heart attack <laughs> you know like it's just who cares you know especially when people aren't paying you to work out you know they're not paying you to go take these big challenges so you you just you just journey through them and I think um you know, you're looking for moments, you know, some people talk about being in the zone. Um, so I'm looking for moments in my training. I don't long, no longer put a lot of pressure on myself. And then, um, uh, and just giving myself new fresh goals. So injury is just part of it. You know, you reflect, you go, I wish I hadn't done that. You just gotta be careful. You don't be stupid. You know, yeah. you don't want to yeah. push yourself when you shouldn't. And who you were when you're 25 is not who you are when you're not 25. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so the other question I wanted to ask you was, 
because you have this discipline and this out, very grounded outlook, um, it seems to me it was somewhat seamless, but maybe it wasn't. When COVID started, it seemed easy. And if it wasn't, I want you to tell me because sometimes people, when they see a director or a head of something that naturally takes control over the situation and puts things in place, they think, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's easy for him. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It's just that when we're leaders, you just, you have no choice. You just naturally are going to do those type of things. And it, you're not thinking, this is how, I'm, how I feel about it. You're not thinking, is this easy or not? That not, has nothing to do with it, right? It's just like, this is what needs to be done. I'm going to do it. So like when you started like, okay, we're going to do online classes and we're going to get people involved and we're going to offer the PE at 1 p.m. so that people that are at home can discover. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that was, maybe it was supernatural for you, but when I see what other people are doing out there and I just think you just went for it and really, you know, that cliche, like turn lemons into lemonade. I was like, this is amazing. Like, right. Like, okay. You have your online library and you have your PE classes and your staff is still involved and you're involving everybody. And it's like, keep going everybody. You know what I mean? Like what, what was going on in your, in your mind? Do you remember? Yeah. Like March is a crazy time for all of us. Right. You know, uh, Seemed like every 12 hours there's a new piece of information coming in. Um, there was a Sunday, there was a Monday when we, I can't remember, oh, sorry, fr a Friday, middle of March, where like we all started realizing how serious this was about to become. And then there was a Sunday where the, I called the staff in and we started hearing about schools shutting down and should we not run day camps and, you know, inside the dojo behind the curtain you know how the sausage is made we debate a lot and i think that's really healthy um uh i have to make a decision at some point but i really uh, value uh the instructors and we have you know full-time instructors we have part-time and they're all like just like a, t a pro tennis coach a pro golf coach they're very experienced they're very, they're very thoughtful and we talk quite a bit and uh really debated and we realized that um, first we're all very comfortable with online stuff you know having done vlogs and podcasts and and um, you know um, and then the karate thing is you're not supposed to give up um, in 2011 uh, in March 11th 2011 there was the massive earthquake in uh, Japan and I was there for that and so was Pete and um, so we've gone through a major disaster um, where there was an earthquake there was a tsunami, there was a, you know, a nuclear power plant explo explosion that all happened 220 kilometers away from us and where we couldn't go to work for three weeks and um, misinformation from the government. And we realized, you know, whatever the government is saying, let's just make it 25% more safe. And then what was really interesting then was, you know, you didn't want to go outside because there was actual radiation falling. And so people are going to the karate dojo because they couldn't go to school just to keep, keep some normalcy going. And so I just had, started thinking like that. Let's just keep it going. You know, um, who knows when this is all going to end. So uh, it was a lot of debate. And that, uh, but either we do nothing or we do action. And I'm, a, I'm an action guy. I like, I like making a decision. You know, is this going to be our collectively as a Canadian society, our POW, you know, stuck in North Korea moment where it's a, we're stuck. We just can't get out of this and we just have to, do we just have to cope and survive? And we've got this very luxurious way of surviving with internet and food and family and stuff like that. So, you know, you can't plan the future and everyone screws up planning the future quite often, but what we can do is make the present better. So that, that's just what we did. And that's what we're doing today. Yeah. So, I think it's great. Thank you so much for all your time. And if you had just one kind of um, piece of information to share with viewers, no matter what age, who are, there's people out there that can find discipline naturally. They have no problem with it. And for people that have a harder time um, committing to something that easily start and easily drop something, um, yeah. do you have any type of advice for, for them? Oh, what a great question. You know, it's something I think about myself too. I recently have found what 
whether it's in work or working out, to give yourself a timeline. Because when you have a timeline, you have a beginning and end, you have an out. You know, so um, you could say, okay, I'm going to do this for eight weeks. And then, and they, you know, in fitness, they talk about eight to 12 weeks being a really good period of time to do something consistently. And then just take the calendar out and just fill in all your workouts. And don't, don't like, it's when, when someone joins a karate club, like I'm coming four days a week. I'm like, nah, you're coming twice. Just, <laughs> yeah. just make it twice. Yeah. You know, after your eight weeks or 12 weeks, then you can think about ramping it up. Um, so a timeline is really good. It's good not just from working out, but I think you probably know this too. It's good when you hire someone, like give them something small to do that then they feel motivated to do it. And as they do really well, give them more responsibility. You do the same thing with yourself. Um, if you want to be strict about it, if you've said, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to work out for an hour and you miss Friday. Well, you're only going to miss if you can make it up somewhere. Um, so that's number one, give yourself a timeline. Uh, and then the other one is don't make the goal too high. Don't, don't make it four days a week. Don't make it for three hours. Don't say you're going to run a marathon at the end of it. Just, just, just be consistent. Just, you know, get in there. Have you, what have you found for yourself? What has worked? I like for, that. Um, for... I like that advice because I think if you make your goals too big, then you're, you're most likely going to fail and then you feel crap crappy about yourself and then you're discouraged you know so I definitely believe like keep your goals realistic and also I mean I've had teachers say like for example if you're going to do a certain yoga pose and it's hard mm -hmm. for you tell yourself I'm going to do this pose and I'm going to hold it for five breaths you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even if at five breaths you can do more don't just keep it like that and just really try to be consistent yeah, yeah. and and just be able to uh, complete your goals. And then you kind of start building that self-confidence as well. And then you feel encouraged just because you were able to keep those goals, you know? So I think I like that idea. Even with yoga, sometimes people say like, the same thing. They're going to try to come every day and, or they ask, well, how often should I come to see results? And you're like, well, if you're consistent, you'll definitely see more results. If you come once a month, it's kind of pointless for you and for me. Uh, you know, like, find something that makes oh, exactly. sense. Yeah. When you do, um, when you do any of like the sports science classes and stuff, so once a week's maintenance, twice a week, you're going to see some sort of result. And then really it depends on the actual training you do in that. If it's easy, is it too hard? Was it too long for you? You know? Yeah. Um, so you got to see that. I mean, you're, you're a parent with your kid. How do you notice when they do well at something? Well, I'm well. very hard. <laughs> I mean, I hold the bar pretty high. That's, that's how I am. Um, I try to be very, very encouraging. And when I notice that they're doing well and everything, but I'm not going to give yeah. fake like claps if it, if I don't think it was something that they really worked on, you know, like mm -hmm. you can kind of tell if it was like a lazy attempt or if it was a real, a real authentic try yeah. at something. So I feel like if it's authentic, they really are putting in that effort even if it's a small steps forward in something, I'm excited that they're taking, taking it seriously, that they think mm -hmm. it's important for them. That's exciting to see that they on their own are like, this is important for me. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. do it. And uh, you can see that they have that, that commitment on, on their own. Um, yeah. Yeah. How about you as a parent? Yeah. I like it when kids have intrinsic effort, I only want three things for my kids. I want them to know that um, I support them however they're going to approach something. So if something with if something A is not that they're not that interested, not that serious about it, that's fine. If B, if they're very interested about it, they want to try harder, that's great. I'm I don't use I really make sure that my Whatever my kids do in their life is not my badge of honor. Is theirs. Yeah. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a lucky front row uh, <laughs> yeah. participant. And it's life is their stage. Now being the front row participant means I pay the most. Yeah. Yeah, I'm paying the bills. So that's number one. Uh, I want them to know that their own value as a person isn't based on whether they did it hard or they didn't do anything. It's just 
they, they have personal value and they can discover that on their own. And second, I want them to work really hard to know that any type of hard work will get a, any type of result. So whether that's in school or, you know, doing an activity, they, as long as they know, hey, I actually want to get something out of this. Okay, you know, hard work is there, consistency is there. And my kids have done pretty well because they've, they've got to their black belt and they had, they had to earn it, you know. Um, and then my third one is, I just want them to be nice to people. Yeah. So I want them to know that being nice um, and having that emotional intelligence to be nice is really important. And then that scale it, you know, like so if someone's not nice to you, then you, it's more like a walk away thing than a, yeah. than a dig in fight thing. Um, uh, so those, those three things for sure. And, you know, think for themselves, like I'm, I'm pretty opinionated. I, I always tell people what I think. Uh, I don't hold back. Um, and so they get to see me, you know, um, you know, especially, you know, it's like when you run your own business, you, you, you're allowed then to be nicer and try harder with your clients and your, your students and stuff. But at the same time, you can really tell people what you're thinking because you're not worried about a boss sitting over you. And um, so I'm, I, I, if they can have those three things and, and be able to speak honestly and that sort of thing, that's great. And then just enjoy their life. You know, we're really lucky to be in a first world country. Yeah. In a, especially in, in BC where this COVID-19 is, uh, is so right now is so not as much of a threat because we're, we, we, we locked it down soon. So now no, we're it's, very lucky. Yeah. I like all that, all that, those philosophies are great. And it just makes me like, think like, um, yeah, we put so much value on doing. And so it's so, really easy to send that message to a kid. Like, I'll love you if you do this, you know, like you're worthy or valuable if you do, instead of, uh, I love you for who you are and who are you? I want to know who you are. Have your own opinions, have your own ideas, have your own, um, tastes for things like you have your own, um, opinions about what you like, what you don't like. And, um, be kind, be compassionate, be aware of other people and also be aware when someone's not treating you nicely. Um, do you stick around? Do you, do you let them mm. abuse you uh, because you want to please them? Do you walk away? Do you say something like, who are you? It's so important. And I've, it's hard sometimes as a, for me as a parent to balance that out with like, please do your homework. Please do your best at school. Um, what, you know, like, what are you doing uh, yeah. during the day instead of just hanging around doing nothing? Like you want things to be productive or... Absolutely. I don't know, yeah, some kind yeah. of intellectual stimulation. I, I don't want my kids on their screens too much. And so, you know, like yeah. there's all these rules, but then at the same time, how do you as a parent send the message, which is, I love you for who you are. I don't, I care what you do, but it's not going to really um, affect my love for you or my respect for you or whatever. I think that's so hard as a parent, you know? Yeah, yeah. I read this great thing on the weekend was, if you're 13 or younger and you're bored, then the adults around you got to work a little harder to, it's your job. If you're 10 or 12 years old or 13 years old, your job right now is to go to school and do your best and figure out what that means. If you're 14 and older and you're feeling bored, that's on you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, you know, it's your, your job is to get out there and to, you know, you, you, you're old enough now, you know, it's sliding scale depending on your maturity, but it's on you to figure out how to get out there and start working hard. You know, I remember I left home when I was 17 and I had to figure things out pretty fast. So um, I think uh, as parents, we have to say, listen, your job as a 12 year old is to get out there and kick some butt in school and see how it goes. Um, but their, their success and whatever they do has nothing to do on my personal self-worth. You know, and I want them to know that like, you, you, you great in school. Fantastic. Yeah. Don't do great in school. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. Um, but that, yeah, I want them to know that I support them through that. Cause you know, sometimes the structure that we put people in or that they're in, they don't realize that that doesn't fit them. Yeah. You know? Um, so it's, I like the idea of just learning how to think and thinking through puzzles and then, then go from there and then just let them be them. You know, most yeah. people figure it out. 
Most people they go, do. And it's hard if you're a kid and you're being compared to the, like your brother or your sister or whatever, you know, like, oh, well, why, they don't have a problem with that. Why, why do you? And I sometimes I do that by accident. I'm like, oh, why did I say that? That was awful. You know, like I want them to be them, themselves and I want them to be independent. And I think like it's okay to be bored. You know, it, mm-hmm. if a young kid's mm-hmm. bored, it's like you can provide creative outlets for them but in the end they have to figure things out and i think they're capable you know and like as a young kid i remember my sister and i like the worst thing my mom could say to us was if we would would go up to her at one point and be like i'm bored and she'd be like only boring people get bored like Mm. that was her response it's kind of like go figure it out go you know what i mean like i i am not here to entertain and to figure out like why you're bored you're yeah. you have that emotional i mean young kids they just do their own thing constantly right yeah yeah there's like that yeah. certain age range where they they kind of sometimes they have that habit like i'm bored mom what are we gonna do or they want that but i just find uh they can figure out their own things they are they can be extremely independent i've raised my kids to be very independent with mm. you know as being like i know almost the team in the house like everyone pitches in nobody's an invalid Everyone knows how to help out, clean, do laundry, cook. Everyone knows how to do everything. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there's no reason to have the parents do everything and the kid is just sitting there. For sure. No, no. And uh, so that kind of, I think that builds courage and confidence in children as well, especially at a young age when they see like, wow, I can do things that I didn't know I could do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And my son just started, he made a decision that he was going to make everybody lunch every day. Cool. So and he's 10 and that was great. And then, you know, uh, it's about him wanting to do it. And I, I try not to make my kids feel like I'm constantly giving them a judgment on their, on their yeah. actions or what they say. I'm, I'm letting, I'm trying to get out of the way and lead by example. Cause I wouldn't want my kids constantly judging me. Yeah. You know, I want to be in a household where we don't constantly, you know, criticize what the other person is doing or wearing or thinking or saying or, or whatever, you know, I find in those households and we see it through the credit club, the kids come in, they're just dead quiet because they know if they say anything or do anything wrong, they might, there's going to be a, there's going to be a judgment, small or light or heavy coming. Yeah. So, so the karate club is supposed to be a safe space. You know, um, it's supposed to be a place where, we're here to change ourselves, get stronger, get smarter, interact with nice people. And so um, it, for some people, it's like a second home. And I, they're not, they may be coming here to look for my, uh, um, uh, my approval of something, but my approval is just going to be keep going. Yeah. You know, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to tell me when you made it. And so at the, at the house, I want my kids to feel that same. And of course they can't, you know, they're legitimately screwing up. I'm going to let them know. Yeah. Um, but we're going to talk about what a legitimate screw up is. So, um, uh, well, there's a certain freedom in that, right? Like there's, you're giving them that freedom and with that freedom comes responsibility. You know, it's like you're free to make certain choices, but then if those are not great choices, then you're responsible for that. I mean, to look at that and see. Exactly. Like in Japan, the one thing you people normally notice is that most people in Japan work long hours. Yeah. They're, they're sort of taught that from school to do really, really long hours. So they're good at the grind. One thing you, as a society, one thing you also notice is productivity can be quite low um, in a long term. Um, but at a, for a frontline person, like in a, any sort of frontline role where they're dealing with clients or people, their productivity is really high. And um, there's a polishing that people get when you go to Japan. And the, sometimes they think it's like, you know, is it a Confucius thing? Is it a Buddhist thing? Is it No, it's just, it's societal, it's cultural. And then just where you fall into that, how hard you want to work in that role. So um, that's one thing I really noticed about being there. People thought, like, it's a, there's a philosophy why we're going to do it. Yeah, the philosophy is go work hard. You know, um, if you want anything, go work hard for it and, and do it. So with kids at home, it's the same thing. You know, if you really wanted to get it, don't don't work hard at it. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. And you mentioned they have black belts. So I'm assuming that they wanted to do karate. It wasn't something that you made them do. But how did that happen? Because 
I mean, I didn't, I never forced my kids, but sometimes I'd say, you guys want to do yoga with me or whatever. And after five minutes, they would just leave, you know, like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. So people always are, oh, your kids must do yoga. And I'm always like, no, they don't. And it's okay. Like, I don't care at all. Like, why would I want them to if they don't want to? But how did you manage to, they just naturally wanted to? I think in our case, the kids get to interact with lots of kids their age. That's number one. And then two is, um, I think they realized pretty quick that was the only way they're going to spend a lot of time with me. <laughs> okay. Especially, you know, so, um, and then we needed, we needed, um, you know, both parents are working. So the kids had to be in after school program. So, and we have a karate after school program picking up at their schools. So they're going to be in the karate after school program. And then they made really good friends in it. And, we're able to do the training, but also have some fun. I remember my son was quite young, four years old, five years old. He'd train for like five, 10 minutes, sit on the floor, be like, I'm done. I don't yeah. want to do it anymore. <laughs> but I'm like, come on, it's really fun. And then we had this big group of um, Japanese university karate students come visit us. And they were all black belts and they're all training to be PE teachers. And they, they love kids. And they, they were, they, we were with us for a week. And my son just looked at them like, they're so cool. And, they're playing games with him. You know, we already play games in the karate club. They were playing new games and he can't, he's like, brain just clicked. He's like, that's it. I mean, black belt, I'm going to try really hard. That's awesome. And he just made the decision on his own. And so, um, and they have, there's parts of karate they like more than others and they don't always have the greatest days, but um, they play other sports. But uh, I think when you're, especially when it's so kid related, like the way the world we're in, it's easier for me to present it in a way that's going to be fun and really beneficial for them. I think yeah. if I, if I took them into the gym and did lifting weights or something, they may not enjoy it because there's no <laughs> other kids around or, you know, um, it's not a, a comfortable, safe environment or it's too intellectual, too, too early. And, um, so, um, yeah, that's probably why. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, my kids, it's, it would be just alone with me at home or once in a while I'd bring, say, do you want to come to the studio and to my class tonight? But it was a bunch of older people, you know, and they would just, after 20 minutes, sit down on their mat and just kind of like, look around. Yeah, yeah When is yeah. this going to be over? You know, like, why'd I come? You know, so, yeah. Yeah, the external response of like, you know, why are ball sports so popular? Because you get an instant response. And um, so you have to, you know, whether you're good or bad at it, the ball moved, you know? And so in karate, we have to do training that they see that there's some action and reaction. And, and um, it's one of the things I really enjoy about it is that you can have elements of so many different sports and activities. There's the stretching and physical side. There's the game side. There's the social interaction. There's a content, you know, there's a competitive side and there's a, is a lifetime of um, enjoyment. And then everything around karate is related, you know, like you want to get good and you got to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Well, and Friday is when the rest of your team meets to work out. Well, I guess you're not going out Friday night, you know, yeah. or you're going to go out later. Or I remember for me, I had to get my homework done before I went to karate class because I didn't want to come home at 10 o'clock and have to do homework. So I would leave school, do my homework and go to karate. And then I was able to get to black belt. And with the other people who, you know, oh, I can't go to karate tonight. I have homework. Well, they didn't make it to black belt. So, yeah. Um, and know. that black belt seems to have such a, um, such a, po- there's something powerful about that. Like, what is that? What does it represent to m- most people who do karate? What does black belt represent? Because after black belt, you still have a lot to learn, it seems like. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it just that's the beginning of mastery? Like that's the beginning that says now I'm really ready or what is the, how do you explain it to people? Why is black belt important? I think black belt is just uh, a landmark in your progression. In Japan, almost everyone's a black belt. Three, four years, you get your black belt. You've just shown that you learned your fundamentals and your basics and now you're going to go really train hard. Outside Japan, I think it can get elevated higher. The meaning of a black belt can be higher than it really is. It's really just, I learned the basics and I can show you that I know the basics and now I want to go and have some fun with them. You know, of course, those 
the first three, four years, those are really, really important core years. Um, but, um, and then after that, it, it, there's a lot more self responsibility for training um, and different clubs approach it differently. It's really just a landmark. Did you learn all the basics and can you demonstrate them? I'm pretty sure in piano and yoga, you have similar things like. Well, you, you know, don't have athletes. levels in yoga because it's a different yeah. philosophy and there's not really, you're not supposed to achieve any type of physical level, uh, even though it's very, it can be very physical. There's not the yeah, level yeah. thing. The West has taken it and made it more uh, physically focused, which is kind of, has become controversial because a lot of people say that's that's not what the point is you're not there to show off what you can do i'm not saying karate shows off but in the yoga world it would be perceived sometimes as people trying to achieve certain poses and the idea is to just be in the present moment and to be grounded and connected mm. that whole time you know and just very steady so um it's changed and evolved because it's been brought to the west meaning us europe whatever but um yeah. and it's well, you know, I about yeah you know, I've been all over Asia and I studied Asian studies and I went to Asian universities. And uh, sometimes there's, um, there's the ideal written on paper and there's the actuality underneath. And then I think you'll find people in, when you're traveling and studying in Asia too, that, um, Outwardly being able to perform or do things sometimes actually does have the same value. So as you as a person, you know, it's like uh, when I was young, I thought, you know, the, you know, the every karate sensei was like, not a priest, but more than a teacher or something. And you get to Japan and or anywhere and you're like, oh, they, they, they're just regular human beings who <laughs> yeah. have all the regular faults and have all the regular you know, um, idiosyncrasies, just as anybody else. And, as, and, you know, we can close our eyes and meditate on the floor as long as we want. Everyone's just going to do the same thing they did before. So I just may, I just wanted to be really practical, you know? Yeah. Um, so if, I, if I'm comfortable in my skin and I'm comfortable with how I interact with other people, I think that's very universal. I so, do too. Um, and like yeah. with the karate world, you mentioned that sometimes you, you've noticed there can be like a cultic thing. And I didn't mm. know about that. And that's so interesting because you see it in the yogic world where, and there's many famous, meaning like international, well-known, uh, most of them are male. Teachers have mm. been um, arrested or accused of sexual assault and taking over yeah. and doing all these awful things. And you just think like, that's not what it was supposed to be about, you know, and, but you see it all over the place and, or you see, um, I don't know if you've experienced this, um, as a sensei, but as a yoga teacher, you, sometimes people project how they think you should be. And, mm -hmm. and you're just thinking, I'm just being honest. I'm in my integrity. This is who I am. And sometimes people love you. Like it's almost, um, you can sense that they're like, they've, they're almost giving away their power to you and you can sense it. So you have to be like, wow, I'm going to stay, I'm not going to let this person think that I'm better than them or more powerful or, or that I'm powerful and they're weak because they're kind of trying to have that kind of dynamic. Have you felt like that sometimes? And you have to just like, you sense it and you're like, we're going to keep this real to yourself. Yeah, yeah, and just kind of it. say that, you know, totally. you got to keep it real. I mean, there's lots of probably everybody in my club can do things that I can't do. Like I can't, I can't hold a hammer or saw or fix anything, you know, <laughs> uh, it's very little that I can do outside of teaching karate and interacting with people. But, um, uh, yeah. So keeping it real is really, really important. And same thing. Yeah. Especially when you go um, Asia, Europe, Africa, you know, they've got the, the rules written on paper and they've got what's actually happening. And it's really important to be, very aware that um, those two things can exist. So the more practical and grounded you can make anything, it's really important. You know, yeah. Um, that's why I don't ascribe to anything that they talk about chi or anything like that because it doesn't exist. You know, if you can't prove it in science, 
it doesn't exist. And it's hard for people to hear that, but you know, when you get on an airplane, you want to make sure science has proved it, you know, or why don't we have polio? Science has proved it, you know, so, and science is evolving, obviously, and it's the same thing in human interaction. And uh, as soon as you layer something on top of it that's not there, uh, it can throw a lot of things off. So, and then it's just work, just go and work out, have a good time with people, you know, that's, I think that's really important. Yeah. And I just want to ask one more question before we, we close our interview, because sure. you've been very generous with your time. So thank you for, for that. Um, no my last question is, there's, some, there's a philosophy um, that you kind of bring about called, you know, being leaders, you know, developing leaders and taking these leadership yeah. roles. So what, what is your vision with that? Or what do you think makes a good leader? And why do we need leaders? And what is a leader? That's a great question. Um, there's a very famous uh, writer, Seth Godin. He wrote a book called Tribes. Seth Godin's maybe like one of the number one um, sort of business marketing teachers out there. You can just look it up, Seth Godin. He has a he writes a daily blog. He's written like a lot of books. He talks about a leader having a tribe, and so the leader figures out, okay, there's something that needs to there's a there's a problem or something needs to happen. We need to organize a bunch of people. And these are like a group of interconnected people and that will give everybody a benefit. So the leaders out there trying to organize everybody to give everybody a benefit. And the best way to lead is to get out there and do it and be an example, not to tell people to do it because that's the rules, but to get out there and actually do it. And I love the, the term being relevant. So in karate, yeah. this is really interesting. Like someone could say, I'm an 8-3 black belt. You must respect me. But I will go, yeah, but you're a horrible instructor for children. So you got your 8-3 black belt by passing individual tests. That's good for you. Great achievement. But when I watch you teach children, you're horrible. So you're not relevant. You know? And so you could have someone who's a green belt, who's amazing with children and connects with them and run circles around teaching an older or higher ranked person. So it's all about relevancy. So a leader should, for me, lead by example by getting out there and doing it. And they should be trying to organize better things for their tribe, for their people. You know, like, let's do events, let's do things that help give more people benefit to give everybody a chance, because everyone wants to change and be better. And you have to be relevant when you do it. So that's, for me, that's leadership. And it evolves. I also look at vacuums. I'm, I'm famous for seeing a leadership vacuum and diving in and sometimes taking on too many volunteer roles and then having to get that thing up and going and then stepping back and letting someone else run with it. Um, so you have to manage your time to know when to jump in on something because, uh, you know, that's what's really cool is people are so creative and there's so many great things to do. And yeah. what are you doing for someone? You're providing a service or you're creating a new, you're creating a, a new product that solves a problem. And that's what leaders do. So um, that's sort of my current thoughts on leadership. You know? Yeah, that's great. And it, it, it fits in whether you know it or not. And you're probably aware that it does. It fits in with being an entrepreneur as well. Um, mm to find needs and fill them and start things. And then once they're up and running, be like, okay, I'm handing this off. You know what I mean? Like I, my work yeah, is done yeah. because some people have that type of personality and uh, drive to see something needs to be done. They do it naturally. And then once it's running, they don't need to be in it anymore because they're not relevant in yeah. it anymore. Right? Like, it's like, I took it where I can. And now yeah. here you go. Somebody else can run with it. And yeah, in business, I, I read a lot of business books. Just I love reading and biographies about how someone started a successful business and all the failures they went through and figured it out. And a lot of times, some people are the ones who just see the problem to the early adopters and they've got to get it going. But there's another group of people that are going to come along and be the farmers and then they're going to keep it going. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, you know, in big examples like Google and Apple, they have lots of those where the founder got it going and then different people kept it going. Um, but relevancy is really important. You know, can you be relevant? You know, I keep evolving in my karate. We've got some really big things coming up in the dojo, especially at the end of COVID-19. That's going to be amazing for everyone so that I can be more relevant and I can keep the dojo and give more to the members instead of sitting back on my 
yeah. accomplishment, just telling everybody, just do what I said, because that's the right thing to do. So relevancy is really important. So I'm really looking forward to, um, we're going through a restart phase. I'm on the restart committee with Karate BC and figuring out how we're going to restart everything. At the same time, you know, be safe and don't rush because yeah. there's no restart until really there's a, va a vaccine. And so, um, so just show leadership by just doing things, just keeping people active. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing um, all of your time with us. I really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your opinions and your views and also a little bit of your family life because that's so, so, somewhat intimate. So thank you for, for being very open and sharing. I think it's great to be, um, I really want these interviews to be authentic and this was extremely authentic and down to earth. So thank you so oh. much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, um, I look forward to listening and, and seeing the other interviews that you do. Great. Thank you so much. See you later.